up, Nomad Summit? Yes, good to be here. What I thought I would do for my talk is thinking back over the past decade, I wanted to pull out the top 10 lessons that I learned from my entrepreneurial journey that I thought would be the most useful and actionable for you guys. So let me start off by saying that all of my academic background and all of my work experience and my entire career trajectory up to age 30 has absolutely nothing at all to do with what I do today, okay? So I have a bachelor's degree in sociology. I have a master's degree in international peace and conflict resolution. And I worked in the nonprofit advocacy space for many years. And it was really meaningful to me. I was doing good work. I was affecting positive change in the world. I was passionate about what I was doing. And it was really, really fantastic. Right up until it wasn't. Right up until there were changes in management in my organization and the workplace environment descended, became increasingly toxic. And long story short, one day I walk into the office and I get called into a meeting. And they said, you, you need to go to this meeting around three, at 3 p.m. I said, I didn't know about any meeting. They said, yeah, well, you got to go. This is meeting at 3. I said, okay. Walked into the meeting, and I got blindsided. They basically said, uh, yeah, it's not working out anymore, so we're going to have to let you go. And we're going to need your phone and your laptop, which was all company stuff, and you need to be out by 5 p.m. So that's how that part of my career Ended, and that day, as I was walking out into the parking lot, now remember, they took my phone, so I literally walked out of the parking lot. I had to drive to the Verizon store to buy a phone so I could call my mother to tell her that I got fired, right? And so on that drive, that very day, I said to myself, this could happen again. It could happen at any time in the corporate world, in the nonprofit world, or anywhere else. And so I am never going to work for anybody else again. I am going to start my own business. There's only one problem. I had absolutely no idea how to start a business. And so, after I went to the Verizon store, I drove to Barnes & Noble, and I started reading books on how to start a business. Now, this was 2007, okay? And every single day, I went into the bookstore, and I read books on how to start a business. And one day, I walked into the bookstore, and a new book was on the shelf business section called The Four-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. How many people have read it? Okay, so I read it probably the day that it came out. I saw it there, I picked it up, and I just read through the whole thing immediately, and I said, this location-independent thing is what I'm going to do. That's the business that I'm going to build, okay? And that's where my career trajectory uh, changed, okay? So lesson number one, do not feel pressure to follow a career path. Always be open to unexpected turns at unexpected times. Always look for opportunity in what first appear to be setbacks, okay? And then finally, reject the sunk cost fallacy. I put so much time into this. I've studied this. I'm such an expert on this. I can't change course now. It may actually be the best thing that ever happens to you to change course, okay? Now, as I was reading these books at Barnes & Noble on how to start a business, and I was learning what it takes to start a business, what I realized was I do not have the majority of the skills and talents that are required to build a successful business. But I know people that do. I know other people besides me that have the skills that I don't have that can complement me. And so I realized that what I needed to do was to recruit two other business partners and that the three of us, as pieces of this puzzle, could definitely do this together, okay? So one of the things that's really important is to audit yourself honestly and be very self-aware of what your strengths and passions are. And then once you realize that, do not focus on improving your weaknesses. Just double down on your strengths and then find other people who can complement your strengths and passions with theirs, okay? And that may be in the form of a business partnership as with mine. It may be in the form of hiring someone, outsourcing things and so forth, but building a team and putting the right people in the right places to do the things that they're good at and that they're 
passionate about. And auditing yourself is where all of that starts. A lot of people, I think, uh, get very tripped up by not auditing themselves honestly and trying to do things that either they're not good at or they're not passionate about and that are not sustainable. So putting the right team together is crucial. And then reverse engineer your business plan, okay? Start from the end and work backwards. So when I knew that the end vision for me was a location independent business that I could run from anywhere, when we were building our business plan, that was our vision, that was our goal. And then when we worked backwards, we made sure not to make any geographically restrictive mistakes that could impede the progress towards that. So for example, my two business partners and I never lived in the same city, ever, not once since the founding of our company. So we forced ourselves to build our business with a virtual infrastructure, okay? So start with where you want to be, include both your financial and your lifestyle goals, and then build your plan working backwards. And that's gonna help you to anticipate and preempt and avoid a lot of mistakes. So for example, if I had instead said, oh, why don't we all just kind of get an office for now and you know, we'll just meet in here and you know, we'll just do this traditionally here and then later on we'll figure out how to make it location independent. What you're doing is you're creating a level of inertia and you're building a lot of infrastructure that can restrict you getting where you want to be. So try to avoid that by starting with your end vision and then doing everything along the way uh, to complement and accelerate you getting there. And then, prepare for the entrepreneurial roller coaster. How many people have heard this term? The entrepreneurial roller coaster? Okay. How many people have experienced the entrepreneurial roller coaster? <laughs> More people than have even heard the term. Fantastic. Um, I can assure you, anybody that didn't raise their hand there, it is very, very real. And one of the top things that I can say, looking back on the last decade, is that crucially, crucially important is to defend your emotional state at all costs. That is one of the core elements of your ability to be productive, of your ability to be inspired, of your ability to be motivated, and therefore of your ability to inspire and motivate and lead others, okay? You will, as an entrepreneur, get the wind knocked out of you again and again and again. And you need to get your bounce back techniques in place in advance, okay? So before you get the wind knocked out of you, think about when that happens, what are you going to do to try to get back, to try to relieve the stress, to resume your productivity routines, okay? How are you gonna get back on your game? Think about things like exercise, things like meditation, maybe things like consuming inspirational video clips that are uh, particularly effective to you personally, okay? And have these routines set up, whether if maybe you do yoga, maybe you do whatever it is that you do that gets your head back straight mentally and emotionally and then have those routines so that when you get the wind knocked out of you, you're gonna know exactly what to do. You're gonna say, okay, this is normal. I was expecting this to happen. It has now happened. Here's the routine that I've written out for myself to do when this happens so I can get back on my game and prepare to have that. It's essential, okay? View the setbacks that you have as a business problem to be solved, okay? You need to transition out of panic mode. You might have a major setback of some kind. You need to transition out of panic mode and say, okay, this is a business problem and I have to view it that way and I have to solve it that way. And then sometimes you just gotta hustle harder. You gotta get up earlier in the morning, you gotta stay up later at night, and you've gotta step your game up another notch and that's gonna be the opposite of what you're gonna feel like doing in the moment when that happens. You're gonna feel like just curling up and going to sleep and watching Netflix and escaping and you have to do the opposite of that, okay? So prepare for that. And then think outside the box 
for bigger picture solutions. Because oftentimes, you have to think very differently to solve bigger problems, okay? I decided, I uh, had a brilliant idea to start a real estate investment company in 2007, right on the verge, the eve of the global financial collapse, the epicenter of which was the US real estate market, okay? So right after I started that business, the US real estate market crashes. People no longer have money to buy real estate, or people that did have money didn't want to buy real estate because they were terrified that the market was going down, and all of a sudden, I lost all my buyers, okay? That's a pretty big setback. And so I had to do all the things on this list. I had to exercise, I had to focus, I had to stay up later, I had to get up earlier, and I had to really, really think outside the box along with my business partners, right? And what we came up with and ultimately ended up doing was we realized that, you know what? We have to go elsewhere to find real estate investor buyers during the bottom of the real estate market. Now the reality was, that basically what this meant, the real estate crash basically meant that real estate was on sale, okay? You could buy it for very cheap. Um, the rental market didn't crash in the same way that the real estate market did, so you could still get good cash flow. Uh, we just needed to find people that were willing to realize that and were willing to buy real estate. And we actually went offshore and started finding buyers in countries like Australia, countries like Singapore, many of which had strong currencies against the US dollar. And from that distance, they were able to say, wow, yeah, this is an amazing deal. And we started selling to international buyers uh, primarily for uh, a number of years. And so that was a bigger picture, sort of think outside the box solution that we had to develop to get through that particular period. Lesson number five, abolish perceived limitations in your mind, and then ignore the naysayers, okay? Now, let me talk a little bit about our business model and what exactly we developed, okay? Maverick Investor Group, uh, so this is the Maverick approach, wealth building velocity and lifestyle design through real estate. So. We started a licensed real estate brokerage in the US in the state of Nevada, which has a number of advantages, not least of which is that every trip to Las Vegas is now a business expense. Um, and what we decided to do though with that real estate brokerage is to serve real estate investors exclusively, okay? So we don't list houses for sale on the MLS or drive primary home buyers around to look for a house to live in with a nice kitchen and a nice garden and any of that traditional real estate brokerage stuff. We serve real estate investors exclusively and we help people buy turnkey real estate investments, okay? So we do exclusively residential properties, so single family homes or two to four unit properties. And we offer our clients the opportunity to buy those properties fully renovated, tenants already in place paying rent, and local property management companies already in place collecting uh, the rent, handling the maintenance, dealing with all of those issues. So our clients that buy through us can own real estate in the best markets, okay? So we identify what we consider the most investor advantaged markets in the United States, all of the real estate in the US, okay? Uh, and then our clients can buy it on this turnkey model so they can live anywhere. They don't have to be near the property. They don't have to be the landlord. They don't have to be the rehabber. They don't have to do any of the stuff that comes with real estate, you know, in terms of the headaches, because somebody else is doing that. Your property manager is doing that. Uh, but you get all the benefits of actually owning the physical property, the deeded real estate, the tax benefits, and uh, the, the cash flow, and the appreciation potential, and all of that, okay? So we've been, fe for this model, we've been featured in a lot of the different real estate press over the years. We've been awarded one of the top 50 real estate investment opinion makers and market leaders by Personal Real Estate Investor Magazine. We have clients all over the United States and all over the world. But when we started out, people said to us, you can't run a real estate brokerage while traveling the world. Are you crazy? And they said, people are not going to buy a $100,000 plus property without ever seeing it or without ever meeting you. Who would do that? Are you nuts? Well, guess what? Our clients do that all the time, okay? But at the beginning, we had to believe ourselves that this business model would add value, that people would want to do this, 
and that we could make this work, okay? And there were naysayers all over the place and we had to ignore them and we had to believe in our vision. So if you are considering a business model that is not a traditionally virtual business, then think about what people might say to you, prepare for that, inoculate yourself for that, and then believe in your vision, okay? You have to convince yourself first and if you don't believe, nobody else is gonna believe, okay? So starting all the way back when I was convincing my business partners to work with us, I had to go to these people who were very successful at what they were doing at their jobs, and I knew they had the skills that I needed, because I didn't have them, right, to make this business work, but I had to go to them and convince them to leave their jobs to start a business with me, even though I had no experience doing anything of this uh, sort of starting a business, right? And I had to sell them on the vision and I had to believe in it 100% myself in order to sell them on it. And then once they agreed and they came on board, we then had to sell the vision to our customers, to our clients and so forth, okay? So as you are going along your journey, self-doubt will creep in. It will, when you get knocked down, it will creep in. You have to be prepared for it in advance, expect it. When it happens, say, oh, this is normal. Everyone experiences it, I'm experiencing now. And then surround yourself with supportive people who can help you to counter that, right? I'm sure everyone here knows people, family members or friends or relatives or somebody uh, that probably thinks you're crazy for what you're doing in this particular lifestyle or the particular business trajectory that you're on or something like that, who doesn't relate to it, doesn't understand it, is of a more traditional mindset. And so you need to surround yourself with supportive, inspiring people so that when that self-doubt creeps in, when you need support, you have that network there available immediately. Uh, because isolation is one of the biggest dangers of entrepreneurship, so do not let yourself get isolated. Lesson number six, avoid the self-employment trap. Build a business, not a job for yourself. So this is me and my business partner, Valerie, at one of our executive leadership retreats in Costa Rica. And what I want to mention about this, I think a lot of people get mixed up when they start their own thing, okay? They leave their job, they say, I'm not gonna work for anybody else anymore, I'm now gonna work for myself and do my own thing, okay? And these are two, this is a really, really important distinction to consider at the outcome, okay? A self-employed person charges fees for their own labor and expertise. If they don't show up for work, they don't get paid, all right? A lawyer that charges $500 an hour is still a highly paid hourly wage earner, okay? There is only so much that you can scale yourself and your time. You have 24 hours in the day, all right? So self-employed people charge fees for their own labor and expertise. Business owners build effective systems and processes and then hire other people to run them, okay? so. You need to think about that. If you are currently a freelancer, or you're a coach, or you're a consultant, or you're someone who charges by the hour or by the project for your own labor, you need to think about your long-term trajectory there. And are there ways that you can build because everybody needs to do that first. Listen, when you're a business startup, you pretty much need to do it all yourself to begin with. But then the question is, can you build a system? Once you are so good at it, can you build a system out of it, write a process for what you do, the way you do it, and then eventually hire people to come in and train them on how to do that for you? So when we started off the company, I was selling the real estate, right? And it's a fairly complicated uh, product, right? Relatively speaking, you gotta know a lot, a lot of the different nuances about investment real estate. You know, it costs over $100,000, so it's a pretty serious, um, you know, uh, amount of money for people and they have a lot of specific questions and so you need to be able to answer them. So you need to be an expert on what you're selling, but then you also need to know how to sell, right? So we developed a consultative selling process, right? Where we are, build relationships with our clients in particular ways, understand their needs, 
understand their financial goals and then customize, help them to customize a financial solution based on you know, investment properties that's gonna work for them. So this entire sales process, yeah, I built that right with my company, but then I was able to develop it into a system and process so I could hire someone else to run that. So I no longer personally do the consultations with our clients and that type of relationship. So we have a sales department now and I've been able to train someone else to run that part of our business, right? So this is the concept of scaling a business. So think about that as you're developing your long-term business plan. And okay, so focus on building your systems and processes. So these are your core business pillars. Marketing, sales, operations, HR, finance, and executive leadership. So when you're thinking about your business and you're thinking about building a business, these are the core components to consider for your systems and processes. Lesson number seven, fiercely safeguard your time. It is your single most valuable non-replenishable asset, okay? I do not take any unscheduled phone calls, right? Literally, my mother texts me to schedule a Skype call with me. I do not pick up my phone. I do not do it, okay? If you check your email first thing in the morning, what is in your email inbox? I'm gonna tell you what's in your email inbox. Other people's priorities other people's agendas are in your inbox, okay? That is a reactive approach, okay? What you need to do is carve out uninterrupted focus time blocks to focus on your priorities and schedule your time proactively, not reactively. I think people tend to fall into these traps where they are responding to other people they're answering the phone when other people want to talk. They're responding to emails when other people want them to respond to their emails, okay? If you schedule time, so schedule your calls. Schedule maybe a block of time when you're going to have all your calls scheduled back to back. Schedule maybe a block of time each day or two blocks of time each day when you're going to do those email responses. But then in between that, schedule focus time blocks where you can focus on the highest value priorities that are gonna move your business forward, okay? And in order to know what those are, you have to audit and analyze the highest and best use of your time, okay? And this is gonna be different for everybody. So you need to do, it's a very personal exercise and you have to do it very honestly and it's really important to do. And what I would suggest, the way to start thinking about this is to apply Pareto's principle to your time. How many people have heard of Pareto's principle, the 80-20 rule? Okay, so it basically says that 20% of your effort is responsible for 80% of your results. Now, how many people here think that they already know which 20% of their efforts are responsible for 80% of their results? How many people think they know which 20% of their effort that is? Very few. Okay, most people don't. What I would encourage you to do is to do an exercise where you audit your time and think about what you're doing each day and think about how much direct productive results are coming from that in terms of your end goals, okay? And figure out which 20% of your effort is producing the 80% of your results. Now, once you do that, then I would encourage you to take it to the next level, okay? And apply Pareto's principle to the 20% of the time. So when you figure out which 20% of your time is creating 80% of your results, go to the next level. Apply the 80-20 rule to the 20%. And what you'll find there is that 4% of your effort is creating 64% of your results. And once you do that, go to the next level, apply the 80-20 rule to the 4%, and you'll find that 
50% of your effort is accounting for 50% of your results, okay? So do this exercise, audit your time, figure out what is in which category, and then as you create your focus time blocks, prioritize the highest value activities that are gonna have the largest impact on your business goals. Lesson number eight, integrate your lifestyle design into your company culture and brand identity. So when I was starting my real estate investment company, I was like, mm, would my clients, would it be good for them to know that I'm sitting on the beach in Thailand? Mm, I'm not sure if they should know that or not. Uh, but what I have discovered over the years uh, is that absolutely this adds value, okay? The number one marketing sin is being boring, okay? So the fact that you are all here in Chiang Mai today and that you are probably in other cool places as well and you're doing cool things, that makes you interesting, okay? It makes you interesting to follow on social media. It makes you interesting to pay attention to, and that's gonna give you an advantage over your competitors who are less interesting, okay? It also makes people wanna work for you, right? This is a core feature of our company culture, and it makes your work much more fun. Plus, it can potentially provide some amazing tax-deductible business expenses. Can't give you tax advice, but consult your CPA. I can show you what we've done, though, so this is my business partner, Valerie, and I, who you saw earlier. This is a different executive leadership meeting, and this one is in Switzerland. You can see a theme here, right? And what we decided to do is we're gonna have three days of executive leadership meetings, and we're gonna have you know eight hours a day uh, to plan our business plan for the upcoming year. And instead of renting a room somewhere and sitting in the room and having eight hours of business meetings per day, we said, you know what? Why don't we get a three-day Swiss rail pass and take some of the most epic train rides on the planet, including the Glacier Express, which is largely regarded as the single most scenic train ride on the planet. It's an eight-hour express train that goes right through the Swiss Alps from San Moritz to Zermatt, and have our business meeting on the train. And so that's exactly what we did. And then, we flew uh, some of the rest of our leadership team over and we rented a penthouse in Zermatt. We did two days of business meetings and then we did two days of team building in the form of skiing Matterhorn. And that was a business expense. So think about how your business can work for you. Think about how you can integrate your lifestyle design. If you're doing cool stuff, people are gonna wanna work for you. If you're stuff, customers are going to want to follow you, right? They're going to want to pay attention to you. So, and you can have a lot of fun with it. Lesson number nine, create affinities. Sell your stuff to people who have things in common with you, all right? So this is one of our reports, one of our content pieces, real estate investing for digital nomads, how to buy U.S. rental properties from anywhere in the world and finance an epic international lifestyle, okay? That is one example, right? People feel more connected, they feel a higher trust and comfort level with people who have shared interests, values, and passions, okay? So all of the things being equal, I would rather hire digital nomads, right? That fits in well with my company culture. I relate to digital nomads. We do this stuff and so forth. So that fits in well with our company. Whose services would you rather patronize, right? So think about that and think about what other affinities you may have. What other types of you know, cultural groups are you a part of or what other types of shared interests do you have with people uh, that you can then position yourselves in those spaces to develop that trust and comfort level and sell your products in those spaces because most likely you'll have a disproportionate advantage, okay? And then the final lesson uh, that I wanna add here, I do wanna give you one sort of uh, travel related hack, uh, which is to travel the world with as little luggage as possible, right? The less material stuff that you have, 
the more you can focus on experiences, the more you can focus on relationships with people, right? And I have found, uh, you know, when I started traveling, I was carrying an enormous amount of stuff. I was, you know, lugging around big suitcases and paying to check luggage, and it was just horrible, right? Checking luggage sucks. They lose it, they damage it, and they charge money for it. So I just don't do it anymore, okay? What it turns out is that you need way less stuff than you think. When I was traveling around with all that stuff, I wasn't using even half of it, all right? So now I can travel the world. I figured out how to do this. I did a whole bunch of research on it. And over the years, I figured out how to travel the world for at least a year plus at a time in both snowy and beach climates with carry-on luggage only. And that includes an espresso maker and a podcasting studio as well, by the way. So the one travel hack that I'm going to give you here today is that, uh, and there are a number of them, but one of them is that about 90% of my clothes are merino wool. How many people are familiar with the unique properties of merino wool? Okay, a decent number of people. I'd say not the majority, though. Okay, so merino wool uh, comes from merino sheep who live in very extreme climates, okay? And so merino wool has very unique properties. One is that it's temperature regulating. So when it's cold outside, it makes you warmer. When it's warm outside, it makes you cooler, okay? Uh, number two, it is antimicrobial, so it does not retain odor. A lot of the merino wool companies that make all merino wool gear will basically issue, they issue a challenge. They'll basically say that you can wear these clothes, this shirt or whatever, for 40 consecutive days, every single day, and it will not retain any odor at all, all right? So uh, it's, pre it's pretty amazing. But if you look at my gear, okay, my dress shirts, my dress socks, all merino wool. The shirt I'm wearing today, merino wool, okay? My running shirts, Running shorts, running socks, all of it's merino wool, right? My hats, my, my gloves, my hoodie, my winter socks, it's all merino wool, okay? So this has been a game changer for me to discover this particular material. And I think, you know, th there's other types of uh, materials as well that are conducive uh, to travel. But this has been probably one of my largest discoveries. And there you can see all the stuff that I'll pack. For a year, it all fits in my carry-on. I take a roller board that fits in the overhead compartment and then a laptop backpack on top of that. So what I did is I actually, um, in, in sort of in concluding here, I put together for you guys uh, some free stuff, which is going to include, number one, it's going to include that uh, white paper that I just showed you a minute ago, the real estate investing for digital nomads and how to buy rental properties from outside the U.S. if you're interested in that or if you're just interested in our marketing and how we uh, you know, uh, you develop that and, and our copywriting and that kind of stuff. I also included a video on how to travel the world for a year with carry-on luggage where I actually go through every single thing that I pack and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so, and then I put together a list. I, I started thinking back on what are my top 10 most influential business books that have been most impactful on me over the last decade. And I compiled that list for you as well. Um, and then my personal contact information, if you want to get in contact with me personally. So all of that stuff is in one place. Just go to maverickinvestorgroup.com forward slash nomad summit, and uh, you can just grab it there for free. So uh, I'm going to leave it there for now. Uh, thank you very much, guys. It's been amazing, and we'll open it up for Q&A if we have time. Are there, I don't know how we're doing questions or if there's a microphone in the audience somewhere. Does anybody have questions? Does anybody want to do a? Hi. OK. Where do you buy merino wool? <laughs> so, so there's a number of brands that sell exclusively merino wool products. So one of my favorite brands is called Icebreaker. Uh, so Icebreaker Merino. Just Google that. They have a website, and they can deliver that. There are other brands. I would say most of my stuff is Icebreaker. I probably have the most of that. Ibex is another one, I-B-E-X. Smart Wool is another one. So those would be three top brands. Uh, if you want more dressy stuff, like this shirt that I'm wearing now, 
uh, is from a company that uh, makes pretty much only this. It's like their specialty product. It's called Libertad, L-I-B-E-R-T-A-D, uh, if you want to get kind of dressier clothes. So I'd say start there. Do you do you have any uh, tips on do you have any tips on uh, researching the connection speed of the internet that of the place that you're visiting? That's a great one. Um, so real quick, I've traveled the world in a number of different capacities uh, and with a number of different uh, approaches. One of which is to rent Airbnbs, right? Just go somewhere, rent an Airbnb for at least a month at a time, so you get the 28 night discount. Um, and when I do that, if I'm going to be staying at the Airbnb, I will grill the host. Uh, tell me what your internet speed is. Oh, really? Uh, can you do a speed test for me and send me a copy of the speed test to prove to me that your internet speed is that speed? Uh, because you really, really need to do that if you're going to be relying on an Airbnb to do your work from. However, I will say that the co-working spaces are probably a much more reliable way to do that. So securing a good co-working space is probably a more reliable solution because even if somebody sends you a speed test from an Airbnb, mm, you know, things can happen. Especially if you're in a, an area, I mean, I've lived in Cairo, Egypt for nine months and they would have rolling blackouts for like four hours a day. I mean, there's just, you know, depending on where you are, there's crazy stuff that can happen. So being in a secure kind of co-working space uh, that's been, you know, reviewed uh, is probably the safest way. I have a question about your team. What does each person specialize in? Yeah, so we have, I mean, a number of different people on the team uh, that do different things, right? So I, you know, my business partner, Valerie, primarily oversees most of the operational stuff from the executive leadership side. I oversee most of the sales and marketing stuff. You know, then we collaborate on sort of business development and that sort of stuff. Um, my third business partner, Mark, is uh, accounting, finance. He's our corporate broker. He does all that side of the business. And then we, you know, hire people departmentally. So we have people that work in our sales department, people that work in our IT department. Um, we have a social media community manager. We have people to do admin stuff, um, contract to close coordinator. Um, I have a virtual assistant in the Philippines. I have, uh, you know, people that do various different things. And we hire a lot of independent contractors too, right? Like a lot of project-based people to just do this, right? Just do our, you know, Facebook ads or our Google analytics or that kind of stuff and so we you know we do we work with a lot of independent contractors and that way some of whom have been with our team for years right I mean they do a particular role but they do it very well and they also have other clients thanks Matt um, I actually have a question for everybody here based on Matt's talk I mean I really love the um, applying the Pareto principle to the Pareto principle to it's very kind of inception I love that and um, I'm gonna apply that to my business when after this conference and, and really see what comes out of that is anybody else already doing that or planning to do that with their business? Show of hands. Okay, there's a few of you. Okay, cool. Um, one thing I'm not going to do from your talk is try and get my mum to schedule calls with me. Uh, good luck trying to do that with an Italian mother like mine. You'd have absolutely no chance. It's a terrible idea. But yeah, thank you so much, Matt. That was a, an amazing talk. And everyone, put your hands together for Matt.